This is the new Tesla Model 3, and it is the coolest car that's coming out this year. Today, I've borrowed this Model 3 from a viewer here in California, and I'm going to show you what I mean. Now, before I get started, I should mention that I'm not one of those irrationally crazy Tesla fans with an obnoxious vanity plate like Kick Gas. In fact, I've only driven a few Teslas, and I don't hold the brand in higher or lower regard than really anything else. But folks, this is the coolest car that's come out this year. For a little proof, consider this. Tens of thousands of people waited in line outside Tesla dealerships to reserve this car, sleeping outside dealerships like it was a Harry Potter movie. When was the last time you saw someone sleep? sleeping outside a car dealership to get a car. Let me give you a hint. There's nobody sleeping outside Toyota of Indianapolis when the new Highlander goes on sale. And it's more than that. These people were lined up outside these dealerships to give Tesla a $1,000 deposit, not so they could bring home a Model 3 today, but on the chance that they could bring home a Model 3 sometime in the next two years. Regardless of whether you like Tesla or hate Tesla, this car is a phenomenon, and that's why it is the coolest car of 2017, or 2018, as it's turning out for most people. But that's not the only thing that makes the Model 3 so cool. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of this car and I'm going to show you all of the cool quirks and features that make this car so exciting and then I'm going to drive it and give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Model 3, click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer where I've written a column about my Model 3 experience. Now, before I get started with the quirks, I want to give one little disclaimer. I'm not some crazy, obsessed Tesla fan who's gone on the forums and read all the threads about this car. I know a little bit about it, but probably not as much as some of the people watching. So please don't email me and say, oh, the windshield rake is actually four degrees more than you said. I'm going to get some things wrong, I'm sure. This is not intended to be a perfect technical briefing. It's just sort of a general overview. And with that, on to the quirks. I'm going to start with maybe the most interesting thing about the Model 3, and that's simply unlocking the door and getting inside. Now, in every other car, you walk up with a key and you start pushing the button and it unlocks the doors, or you leave the key in your pocket. In this car, you don't do any of that because there is no key. Instead, the key is contained in an app on your phone. So I've got the owner's phone in my pocket. I'm going to walk up to the car and it's going to automatically unlock as I approach. Watch the mirror on the driver's side of the car. It's set to fold out as the doors unlock. And if you watch the mirror, you'll see when they unlock as I walk up to it. Take a look. Walking up, owner's phone in my pocket, mirror unfolds, and now the doors are unlocked and I can get right in. There's no key that you use at any point when you're getting into this car. And when you want to get started and go, just basically put your foot on the brake, put it in drive, and you're gone. Now, if you want to lock your doors, it's pretty simple. It's basically the exact reverse procedure. Just walk away with your phone in your pocket, and when you get far enough away, the doors lock and the mirrors fold right back, which is the state they're in right now. And you might be wondering what happens if you lose your phone or if you let someone else drive your car. How are they going to get in? Do they have to bring your phone with them? Not quite. This car has a secondary key situation. And it's this. It's basically a hotel room key size little key card that you can stick in your wallet. And if you lose your phone or you're giving your car to someone else to borrow, simply give them the room key. And in order to unlock the car, they walk up to the side of it. You'll notice it's locked right now because the mirror is folded in. You put the room key here. Mirror folds out, and now the car is unlocked. I get inside, I place the room key right next to the cup holders, and then it's on, and I can start driving it. Now, it's worth noting that that key card doesn't have a little slot where you can put it on your key ring, but you wouldn't want to do that anyway. It's a card that fits in your wallet, and plus, most owners will simply just use their phone. Keep it in their pocket, unlock, lock the doors, get in, and drive away. And the phone app does a lot more than just lock and unlock the doors. For example, the owner can use the phone to flash the headlights in case you've lost the car in a parking lot. In case you've really lost the car, you can use the phone to honk the horn. You can also use the phone to open the rear trunk, or you can use the phone to open the front trunk. You can even use the phone to start up the climate control. So if you're getting ready to go to work in the morning, you can turn on the climate control and have it the perfect temperature when you get inside the car. Obviously, the phone can also be used to control various charging functions and even open the charge port and close it again. I'll show you more on that in a minute. 
And another amazing capability of the phone app is it can give remote access to the car no matter where you are. So if you let someone borrow the car and they lost the little key card, well, that's no problem. You can unlock the doors from anywhere. You don't have to be standing 25 feet away. You could be in Europe and you could unlock the doors or charge it or open the charge port if you want to. It's all possible from the phone app. This is the future. This is how it should be. And it means that maybe someday soon we won't have to carry around a giant key ring like this. Won't that be nice? Now back to the charge port. You saw it open just a second ago and I was showing you all the things you can do with the phone, but there are about a million ways to open the charge port, all of which are interesting. Now, if you want, you can just tap it and it pops right open, and you can also tap it and it closes. That's probably the easiest way, but there are several others. My favorite is that you can simply walk up to the charge port with the charger itself, push a button, and then it pops right open. Now, when you insert the charger into the charge port, the little status light is a Tesla logo, and it pulses in green to let you know that it's charging. Unplug it and it's blue. It's kind of cool to see it change colors. The other cool thing about the charge port, when you simply walk away after having charged the car, it will close automatically. So all those ways to close it and open it, you don't even have to worry about that. It'll do it for you. Now, speaking of that charge port, one of the things I like best about it is that it's integrated into the taillights, so you never really know it was there unless you're actually charging the car, unless you know it's there. Now, on to the back of this car and the trunk. This is not a hatchback, even though it sort of looks like one. It has a regular trunk, although there are a couple things about the trunk that are far from regular, one of which is just how far up it goes. It goes halfway up the C-pillar. It's, it's almost like it wanted to be a hatchback, but it just couldn't. And so now the trunk is open, and there are a couple of interesting things worth noting inside of it. In fact, there are three especially noteworthy things inside the trunk. The most unusual of which to me is the fact that if you get inside the trunk and you look up at the ceiling of the trunk, you'll see sort of a little see-through grate there. It's very odd. It's almost like they put that in there so people could look into the trunk and see what you're carrying in case they want to rob you. Instead, it's probably there to dissipate air when you close the trunk because it has to go somewhere. The other two interesting things in the trunk, number one is there's a little area where you can store small items below the floor of the trunk. And I really like the fact that the cover over this area sort of flips right up so you can rest it against the ceiling of the trunk. That means that it's easy to just close again. And speaking of items you load into that area, take a look at the charger bag. And you'll notice something about the charger bag. It's sort of this material that would slide around in the trunk if you're going around corners. So Tesla has smartly fitted it with some Velcro. Stick it on the trunk and then it won't slide around. You'll always have your charger stuff. Now, since we're talking about the rear trunk, we might as well move on to the front trunk or the frunk as some people call it. Now, because this car doesn't have a huge combustion an engine up front, they can put an extra storage up here, a trunk, and in fact they have. It's not that big, but it is relatively large. You can stick some stuff in here, and there is a little escape light. All trunks, by law, must have a little way to get out of them if you're stuck inside so you can't be kidnapped and stuffed in a trunk. In this car, it's actually really cool. In the front, they've integrated it into the regular trunk light. So the trunk light lights up so you can see what's in there, or you can push the trunk light and it's a latch to get out. I'm not really sure exactly who can fit inside this trunk, but I suppose they just have to do it no matter how big the trunk is for regulations. A couple of other interesting things inside the trunk, one of which is there are little grocery bag hooks. So if you don't want your groceries to fly around, you can use these hooks, just stick them on there. The other thing that I find interesting is the fireman's label. This is a label for firefighters and it shows exactly where they have to cut in order to disable the battery so this thing doesn't blow up. Now there's also one of those labels in the rear trunk, but while the front trunk's label makes it seem like you can easily disable the power supply with, I don't know what those are, some sort of garden tool in the back you need to take a saw to the C pillar and that makes it a little bit more challenging in order for the Model 3 not to explode after an accident. Now, when it comes to closing the front, it's actually a little bit more difficult than I expected. It closes initially pretty easily, just like this, like it is in a lot of other cars, but then when you actually close it, you have to put some force here in order to get it to close all the way. Now, before I move into the interior of the Model 3, a couple of other interesting exterior details, starting with the windshield wipers. There are a couple of interesting things about the windshield wipers, one of which is that when they're off, they're sort of tucked in as low as they can possibly be, almost underneath the hood for aerodynamic purposes. Getting them off the windshield lets air pass over the car. It makes the car more slippery, and it increases the range, probably. Anyway, the most interesting thing about the wipers is that in order to get them down there, they had to kind of weirdly shape the bottom of the windshield shield. Take a look at this. It sort of comes to like a widow's peak point under the hood, and it isn't even symmetrical, but they had to do that in order to find a spot for the windshield wipers to fit. Another interesting thing about the Model 3, it doesn't say Model 3 on this car anywhere. The only place where it does is when you open the doors, it says Model 3 and only aluminum sill plates. Other than that, 
you don't know what you're looking at. In fact, it doesn't even say Tesla. It only has the Tesla badge in the front and the back. Otherwise, nothing. All right, now it's time to get inside the Model 3. I've already shown you how to lock and unlock the doors with the phone app or with the little hotel key card, but how about the door handle itself? Now, if you're familiar with the Model S, the door handle pops right out. It doesn't do that in this car. Instead, to open the door, you push the back of the door handle, the front part comes out, and you open it right up. It's actually pretty simple. Now, I'll get into the specific quirks of the interior in a second, but I want to talk about maybe the quirkiest thing of all about this interior, and that is just how simple it is. When you get in this car, it's hard not to just be amazed. You get into all sorts of other cars, and there's buttons and switches everywhere, and in this thing, there's so little. Basically, no labels or buttons, anything to distract you. But this is just a complete 180 from more and more complicated car interiors that you might be seeing. Okay, so I've shown you how to get in the car using the exterior door handles. Now it's time to move on to the interior door handles, but they're not handles at all. This car is way cooler than that. Instead, they're just little buttons. You push it and the button unlatches the door and it also swings it open a couple of inches, then you have to do the work from there. Now, interestingly, those buttons are electronic, so if the battery dies, they won't work. Fortunately, Tesla has placed a manual solution on the front doors. It's right above the window switches. You pull it and then you manually unlatch the door in case the battery dies and the electronic buttons don't work. But notice I only said on the front doors, the rear doors don't have a manual door release. So if you're driving along your Model 3 and you're in the back seat and the battery dies, you won't be able to get out the back doors because your button won't work. Instead, you'll have to climb into the front seats and use the manual release up front. Now, interestingly, you're not supposed to use that emergency interior door release regularly, only in an emergency, because when you do use it, a little warning light pops up on the center screen and tells you that it could damage the window trim if you use it, which is interesting. Now, speaking of the windows, I'm going to start this interior tour in the back. And one of the most interesting things about the back of the car is the rear windows. They roll down, but not all the way, not even close to all the way. It's actually kind of interesting. There's like six inches of window still left when the window is all the way rolled down. Now, the rear seat is a bench, and it folds down if you have stuff in the back that's too large for the trunk. There are three seats back here, two on either side and one in the center, and it's pretty roomy. This seat has moved all the way forward, so of course I can lie down, but I could even sit behind the driver's seat, which is positioned how I would sit, and it would be tight, but it would be fine, and I'm six foot four. Now, if you don't have someone in the middle seat, you can put the center armrest down. It goes down pretty easily, and it's just like any other center armrest. It's leather. It has a couple of cup holders. It's pretty simple. The most interesting thing, I think, about the center seat is that the center headrest raises, which means that you can have someone in the middle and you can give them a headrest. And if they're not there, you can put the headrest down for better visibility. Another interesting thing, above each rear window, this car has little coat hangers. When you push them, they pop out ever so slowly so you can hang your coats. It doesn't have those handle things in back like some cars do where you can hang your coats. Instead, these coat hangers are what you're going to use. All right, moving on to the front seats, we have a few different storage areas. There's a little storage area in the center console, pretty standard. There's the cup holders, also pretty standard. There's a storage area in front of the cup holders, which is actually surprisingly deep. And then there's my personal favorite. That would be the storage area right under the giant center screen. And the reason I like this one is because it has little slots where you can just stick your phone and you can charge it while you drive underneath the storage area that plugs into a USB so you can switch out if you have an iPhone or an Android or whatever. Now, the coolest thing about this is you can just stick your phone in there while you're driving. You never take your eyes off the road and the phone will charge and you can just use the screen for everything. And then when you get out of the car, you have to remember that your phone is plugged in there. It's worth noting, however, that the lid is a little finicky. It uses a magnet to stay down and if you push too hard, it pops back up. You have to close it just right for the magnet to hold it in place. Now, a couple of other things before we move on to the center screen, which is probably the most interesting part of the car. One of those things is the hazard lights. Now, I believe it's a federal regulation that the hazard lights must be an actual physical button. So Tesla couldn't integrate it into their screen, which has basically everything else. But they didn't want to clutter their, their simple interior with a hazard light button, so instead they stuck it on the ceiling. So if you're looking for the hazard lights on a Model 3, it's up here next to the driver's head and at the top of the windshield. Also interesting and not part of the screen are the stalks that come out of the steering column. They have your normal function on them. The one on the left controls the turn signals and it also controls the windshield wipers. Annoyingly, it's one of those turn signal stalks like BMW that doesn't stay in position. You put it on and then it pops back into the middle, so you never really know if your turn signal's on or off. Over on the right is the gear shifter. You move it from reverse to neutral to drive. You put it in park by pushing the end of the stock. And maybe most interestingly, if you want to turn on cruise control or autopilot, you double tap the stock down and that turns it on. 
Also interesting are the sun visors. You open them just like any other sun visor, but the cover over the visor mirror is this flimsy little piece. Why is it so flimsy? Because it's a magnet. This way you can stare at yourself without it affecting your forward visibility with the visor down. And next up is the climate control vent, which is another really interesting thing in this car. I say vent because there's just one. It is a giant climate control vent that goes across basically the entire dashboard. And when you adjust the climate settings using the screen, the giant climate control vent does whatever you tell it to. But that's not the most interesting part of the climate control vents. The most interesting part is right above the little wood trim, there is a second vent, and that's the one that directs the air. Basically, the way it works is the air blows on you when it's in its default position. It just blows out out of the giant vent and onto you. Now, if you want it to blow upwards, instead of vents under the dashboard changing their position, the secondary air vent behind the wood paneling, that starts to blow upwards and it changes the direction of the air that's coming out of the giant vent. So it blows higher in the car. This is totally crazy. It's a bizarre solution to changing the direction of the air. And how do you control where that air comes out? Why, that would be the center screen, of course. The center screen is gigantic. It is incredibly responsive to your touch and it is completely fixed. You can't move it and it's actually really, really thickly stuck on there. Even if you want to try to push it around and do whatever with it, it doesn't go anywhere. It's really bolted down and it has some amazing functionality. Let's take a look. First off, it's truly amazing how responsive this center screen is, better than any other screen in any other car. Just move around your finger and the map moves without any lag or delay, and of course, pinch to zoom works perfectly. This is just as good as the screen on the very best phones. Next up, it's time to cover the items along the bottom, starting with the windshield defogger. It's normally white, but tap it once and it turns blue for cold air. Tap it again and it turns red for warm air. The next button is the rear window defroster, which of course just turns red when you turn it on. Then there's the icon for the heated seats. Push it once for full heat and push it a couple other times to lower the heat. Next up is climate control, which is incredibly easy to adjust, and when you turn it up all the way, you'll be stunned how much air comes out of that giant center vent. It feels like a hurricane inside this car. Just listen for a second. What are those weird icons on the side of the climate controls? That's the position of the center vent. Move around the dial and it moves around where the air is coming out on the driver's side, but the coolest part is if you push this little icon, it splits the air vent and now you have even more control over where it comes out. Of course, you have the same functionality on the passenger side, meaning you can have two vents, driver and passenger, or three or four if you split the vents. The next buttons are fairly straightforward. The music icon brings up the radio, the phone icon brings up the phone controls, and of course, volume brings up volume which is a bit annoying. I think we'd all rather have a traditional circular dial. On the left side of the screen, you have the gear you're in and the warning lights, and that's also where the car displays the speed you're traveling and the turn signals. Note that it's not directly in your line of sight. You can also use the left part of the screen to open the front trunk, push it, and it opens, or to open the rear trunk, same deal, push it, and it opens. The screen is also yet another place where you can open the charge port, though it conflicts with the trunk. You can't open the charge port if the trunk is open. When the trunk is closed, you can use the screen not only to open the charge port, but also to close it. And when you do anything with the charge port, it brings up the car's current charging information, showing its range, letting you pick what percentage you want to charge it to, and providing a scheduled charge option to allow you to take advantage of lower power rates overnight. Also on the left side of the screen, swipe over and you can find the windshield wiper controls. They're on the left stock, shared with the turn signal, but you can also turn on and off the wipers using the screen. But the most interesting item is the button on the bottom left as it brings up the car settings. This is where you do basically everything. In fact, this is where you turn on and off the headlights. It's also where you do something really cool, adjust the mirrors and the steering wheel. This is by far my favorite center screen related item. Now when you get inside the car, you'll notice that there are two little wheels on the steering wheel. Do they control volume, the track? That's probably what you think, but actually they control a lot of different stuff depending on what you're doing. If you're in the stereo, yes, they can control the volume and the track, but if you're in the car settings, they can control, for example, the mirror movement. Move the wheel up or down and it adjusts the position of the mirror. Move the little control to the left or to the right and it also adjusts the position of the mirror. And of course, the control on the other side of the steering wheel adjusts the other mirror 
and it doesn't. And there, check this out. Put it in steering wheel adjustment mode and those little wheels adjust the position of the steering wheel. One of them tilts it up and down and the other one telescopes it forward and back. And yes, as I showed you, the scroll wheels go up and down, of course, but they also go left to right and they feel pretty high quality. They don't feel like they're about to fall out or that they're jiggly or anything. You got to admit, this is a lot cooler than the volume button on your car's steering wheel. Back to the center screen, there's no switch for the dome lights. Instead, you turn them on and off right here and they respond quickly to whatever you set. The next interesting tab is for driving and we must talk about the little setting for creep. Creep is one of the most interesting things. Now you know how in your car, your automatic car, when you let your foot off the brake, it sort of rolls forward just a little bit? Well, in this car, that's configurable. You can turn it off and then it won't roll forward or you can turn it on and then it will roll forward like a typical automatic car. It's something you can change. You can change everything about this car. There's also an autopilot tab for Tesla's automated cruise control system. It lets you set your following distance and there's a tab for safety and security, which oddly is how you set your parking brake. Normally you won't need one, of course, but if you're on a big hill, you also use the screen to open the car's glove box. As for the buttons on top, use this one to lock and unlock the doors. This one is home link, linked to your garage door opener, and it's aware of your location, meaning it pops up as you get into your neighborhood and it senses you'll want to open your garage door. The last item opens up some Model 3 Easter eggs, my favorite of which is the little drawing program that lets you paint a nice little picture as you drive down the street. The other interesting one is the planet. Push it and the image of your car becomes a rocket ship. Push it again and it goes back to being a car. And one other cool thing in the screen, when you put this car in reverse, obviously the backup camera comes up. That's not particularly interesting, but check this out. When you get really close to something, it doesn't just start beeping or show you with a little red green how close you are. Instead, it tells you the exact number of inches away from something you are. So you can perfectly park this car in your garage exactly where you want it. So those are all the cool quirks and features of the Model 3. It's amazing how many interesting quirks you can pack into a little mid-sized compact sedan thing. Anyway, now it's time for me to do something I know thousands of you are waiting for the chance to do. I'm gonna take the Model 3 out on the road. I feel like the coolest guy in California right now. And this is the kind of place where people are going to recognize this. If I was in Texas, people would be like, oh yeah, it's just a Tesla. But here, everybody knows the differences. They're all really obsessed. They're hyper obsessed. All right, so I'm driving along. I'm going to floor it. Whoa! <laughs> okay. Wow. That, uh, that's pretty quick. Uh, let's do that again. <laughs> wow. You know, I drive a lot of fast cars. And so that's, you know, it's not like a Ferrari, um, but there's two aspects of that speed that really are impressive. Number one is obviously that it's noiseless. I mean, that's incredible. You put your foot down and, and you hear nothing. Um, and the other one is you put your foot down and immediately you just hear. It's incredible how fast uh, it just happens. From a stop, it feels reasonably quick, but it's still a heavy car that has to get going. Where it, where it really feels impressive is when you're going 40 and you put your foot down. That's where this car is, I think, really going to take over BMW and all them. Um, it just, those cars have to gear down a couple gears and the engine has to spool up. And this thing, you know, you're cruising along at 25, 26, 27, 28. Whoa, now we're gone. <laughs> like, now, one of the things that people who have driven this car have talked about is that the center screen obviously takes the place of even the gauge cluster. So when I look directly ahead of me, it doesn't show the, the speed that I'm going. I have to look over to the side. And I do find that a little bit disconcerting. I think that you'd get used to it. And it's worth noting, even though that's been a huge deal, it's not all that uncommon. The Saturn Ion had the gauges in the middle. The Nissan Quest did. The BMW Z8 did. It's not even unusual in performance cars. So this isn't the first car where people have to look into the center. But of course, I'm used to looking directly directly forward and I find it to be a little bit unusual. Now the owner tells me the most unusual part of it is the turn signals, the speed you get used to quickly and it's kind of in your periphery. It's a pretty big font and it's sort of right there at the top corner of the screen. The problem is the turn signals and I can totally see that when you put on the turn signal, it's not blinking right in front of your face. It's sort of over on the side and it's a rather small little indicator that shows that the turn signal is on. And so you have to kind of remember that the signal is on. The steering is, is quite precise. It's kind of interesting. It's very responsive. The moment you start to turn the wheel, the car starts to make a turn, uh, even like a lane change or something like that. And as a result, it's very predictable. It's very, it has a very linear steering feel. 
it doesn't have any on center vagueness. The moment you start to turn it, it starts to turn. Um, so it's not like you know your grandfather's old Lexus where you can move it an inch in either direction and nothing happens. Uh, it, it turns quite quickly. I will say it's very light steering, as is the case in most modern you know sort of luxury cars. It's not a sports car in that sense. The steering is designed. It's sort of over assisted, designed to make it easy for you to turn. I've switched the steering mode over to sport. The moment you do it, you can feel it's heavier. It's still just as uh, as immediately responsive as it was a second ago, but it just feels instantly. It feels heavier. It's not. It's still not sports car heavy. It's not like I'm driving around in like a, you know, Miata or anything like that. But it, it does feel like it's tightened up. It's very quiet. Obviously, I mean, it's a, it's an electric car. There's no engine. But it's very quiet when you're stopped. Now you do hear uh, exterior noise. You hear other cars driving by. It's not bad. It seems like about normal. I think the zero to sixty number doesn't tell the whole story. I think that that really the speed comes in uh, when you're going forty and you floor it. That's where you really, really kick you. Uh, if you're in a Model 3 and you come next to some guy at a 340i at a stoplight, you won't beat him. But if you're going 50, you probably will. The ride quality seems about normal. Uh, we're on kind of a rough road here. Um, it's not. It's not dramatically comfortable. Um, I think it feels a lot like a C-Class or a 3 Series. The owner tells me that the, the, this car has 19 inch wheels as the upgraded wheel and the, the 18s are supposedly more comfortable, but I don't find it to be that bad. I mean, if you're used to driving sort of sporty little sedans, um, 3 Series, that sort of thing, I think you'll, you'll find it about, about normal. One, one thing I think that's important to point out, there's no creaking, rattling, jiggling of stuff inside the car. Um, I don't hear any of that stuff. Uh, there's obviously a lot of concern and question about quality with these cars. We all know that some of the early X's had uh, some panel fitment issues, and obviously they're very delayed with the production of this car. And so there's like, well, why are they delayed? You know, are they are there issues with quality? It doesn't actually. I mean, this this sounds and feels like any other vehicle, uh, any C-Class 3 Series that you would buy off a production line. The visibility is really is really pretty good. The mirrors are normally. Shaped, they're a little odd, but they show exactly what you'd expect them to. You get a ton of visibility out the front, the back. I don't see any um, visibility issues. Obviously, this one has this giant panoramic roof, and so there's, you can see in every direction. In terms of uh, room, roominess, obviously, I'm six foot four, and so people are always emailing me and asking, well, how tall are you and how do you fit in these cars? In this car, uh, I fit just fine. It's completely comfortable and normal. Um, my knees have a lot of room, I have a lot of room, my legs have a lot of room, my headroom, I got six inches or four inches or something above me in a glass roof. Um, you know, I wasn't expecting anything crazy. Uh, ultimately, this isn't some weird sports car where it's like some sort of problem to get into. Uh, one of the things that impresses me about this car is it feels a lot like a normal car, which is kind of the point, I think, of Tesla. You can get uh, all these cool things and you can get out of the future of, you know, propulsion, but you don't have to make weird compromises. Um, you know, I'm sitting here right now and looking at the thing, it says 271 miles until we're out of charge. <laughs> That's a long distance. You don't have to do weird, weird things like, you know, there's a hump in the rear because there's some battery situation. It's not like crap. This car is this car is just well engineered. It, I think a great compliment that I can pay this car, and I feel this way, is that it's a car and it feels like a car. I personally would prefer having the gauges directly in front of me, or at least this like the mini. Like the mini has all this stuff in the middle, but then it has the little speedometer thing and a couple of other things right in front of you. And I would prefer that. Uh, I don't love having to look all the way over. I think it kind of makes it a little bit more challenging. I feel pretty confident. Oh wow. <laughs> Wow, I mean, I didn't really slow down. That was a 90 degree turn, but with a little yield thing, I didn't really slow down all that much. And I took that at 30, 35 miles an hour and it felt really good. The tires didn't get loose and it didn't feel like sort of the tall car that I think it kind of looks like. All right, I'm gonna put on the, the autopilot. I'm on the worst road with the worst lane lines. I mean, autopilot is not a, an exciting thing anymore, right? They pay, everybody's kind of knows about it and they've seen it. <laughs> It's turning and it's kind of losing the line. These lines are horribly painted, but it's, it's handling it from better than I expected. Um, I think it's doing a better job keeping it within the lane lines than drivers from Maryland. I'm also surprised by the build quality. I think it's I think it's, it's pretty good. Um, you know, there's a little there's a little bit of panel fitment issue on the, between the driver door and the pillar. I mean, I, there's little things here and there. There's a little bit of wind rush. I'm especially a little bit disappointed in the steering wheel. There's some plastic on it. Um, it doesn't look all that nice. Mercedes has this really nice looking steering wheel that maybe looks like a performance car or a luxury car or whatever, but. 
I think these are minor gripes, and I think the complaints that I have about this car are outweighed by the benefits. I think people who, who put in reservations and gave that thousand dollars on the theory that they might get one of these at some point, uh, I think they're going to be happy with, with their car. And so that's the new Tesla Model 3. I don't care if you like Tesla or you hate Tesla, and I understand a lot of the arguments on both sides, but you have to admit this car is a sensation. It is absolutely the most anticipated and coolest car that's coming out in 2017. I flew all the way across the country just to drive this car and check out its quirks and features. And now to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Model 3 is attractive, but I don't think anyone would consider it gorgeous or beautiful. It's maybe a little more attractive than average and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration, this is the long range model, which is an upgrade and it does 0 to 60 in 5.1 seconds. The base model will do it in 5.6. The 5.1 second figure gives this car a 5 out of 10. Handling is good, quite impressive, but 6 and above is sports car territory and it's not quite there with light steering and a large four-door car to move around, so it gets a 5 out of 10. Next up is cool factor, and this one should not be in dispute. If this car showed up at your local Cars and Coffee, people would say, what LaFerrari, and mob it to see one of the first Model 3s in the world, and it gets a 9 out of 10, same as the Lexus LFA, one shy of the Porsche 918 Spyder. The Doug score is dynamic, and I suspect this number will change as Model 3 production ramps up and they start to become more common. As for importance, it's not quite as high as cool factor, but this is among the first electric cars with these sorts of numbers that's within reach of normal people. The base model will go 220 miles for $36,000, and for nine grand more, the long range one will go 334 miles, which is an impressive figure. That's a big deal in the car world, and it gets an eight out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to 33 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The Model 3 is loaded with stuff, but some things are still delayed. To my knowledge, it still doesn't have a traditional AM FM radio which is supposedly coming soon with an update. Still, this car is the future and it feels like it and it gets a 9 out of 10. As for comfort, it has a good solid ride, not like an ultra high-end luxury car, but a luxury car befitting its price tag and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is a sore spot. The interior is certainly not on the level of BMW or Mercedes, especially that relatively ugly steering wheel, but build quality wasn't as bad as I was expecting. Still, first year of a new model from a new company, I'm giving it a 6 out of 10, but if this car turns out to be shockingly reliable, I might raise that. Next up is practicality, and the Model 3's 14 cubic feet of cargo space would give it a 5, but the fact that it's fully electric and it's long range easily bumps that figure up to a 6 out of 10. Finally, there's value, and the Model 3 is an odd proposition. It does 0 to 60 in 5.1 seconds, placing it just short of the BMW 340i, but it's five grand cheaper. But the interior isn't as nice as the BMW, and the Model 3 doesn't quite handle as well. But the Model 3 has more tech, more cool tech, and the Model 3 is the hotter new model. Still, top level Model 3s with all the fixins will cost 60 to $70,000, and that's big money, so value can't go higher than a 7 out of 10. Add it all up, and the total daily score is 35 out of 50, placing it near the top and making it the highest highest car in its price range. Add it all up and the total Doug score is 68 out of 100, which is by far the best score yet for a car at this price level. Admittedly, a few points are due to its cool factor at the current moment, so it could drop a bit, but it's still a strong figure with good showings in both daily and weekend categories, which makes sense. This is a great all-around car.